Hello and welcome to the Omnex webinar, Effective Implementation and Use of Design and Process FEMA. Today's presenter is Dave Watkins. Dave Watkins is an Executive Vice President and Director of International Operations and Principal Consultant for Omnex. Dave has been involved in the evolution of risk management and new product development and launched first as a manager and executive in a number of companies supplying automotive, aerospace, and agricultural equipment industries, and then he worked as a consultant and trainer with a principal focus on APQP and PPAP. He has developed and delivered training on APQP system design and process FEMA for automotive IATF 16949, aerospace and defense AS9145, and high tech for electronics and semiconductor all over the world. During this presentation, if you have any questions for Dave, please enter them in the Q&A box, and he will get to them to the best of his ability at the end of the webinar. There will be a couple polls during this webinar, so please be aware of your screen and answer the polls as soon as possible. This webinar is being recorded, and someone from Omnex will reach out to you with how to access the recordings after the webinar, approximately one to two weeks. All right, Dave, you can take it away. Well, thank you, Miles. And hello to everyone out there in the virtual and real world. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, appreciate your, your interest. I am Dave Watkins, as Miles explained. And uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, this discussion we're going to have today is not really about how to do FMEAs, although we will get into that a little bit. It's more about what we have learned at, with 30 years or more experience in using FMEAs uh, in all of the, the markets in the world that, that Miles mentioned, automotive, aerospace, high-tech, semiconductor, uh, even service industries. I've been involved uh, with them since the early 90s. Omnex has been involved with it since before there was an APQP in the, in the 80s. In fact, we'll be talking a little bit about software because as early as the 80s, when we were working with clients to use uh, basic process FMEAs, these were, were basic make to print suppliers to the automotive world, uh, we could teach them and show them, but the fact that there was no tool has continued to be, even since then, a significant issue for companies trying to do uh, good new product development, employ APQP effectively, and in particular, uh, em employ FMEAs. And unfortunately, even with the evolution of pretty good software tools for this, we still, I personally and my associates still continually run into organizations where People are being expected to try to do good work in engineering products and engineering processes and systems and not being given the tools, not being enabled to do the work effectively. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the overall process. And then the focus of today's talk is gonna be about some of the elements of the process that we have learned over these 30 years of experience and in my case, literally 27 years with Omnex and over 20 years before that in industry, uh, the lessons we've learned are, are about what are the things that enable this process and the organizations using it to be successful, and what are the things that, if they're neglected, will pretty much ensure uh, little value generated and often significant failures. So the first one, the obvious one, the one we're all aware of, but nonetheless, it's still there, is a, a, an enterprise trying to do new product development launch, trying to incorporate APQP, trying to employ FMEAs effectively, and does not have the support or the commitment of time and resources, uh, or even the uh, awareness of the value proposition by top management. Now, frankly, this is changing. It's taken a while, but I now find myself engaging with executive and, and senior management teams at corporate and division and, and group and site levels who, who get it now and who are uh, 
investing not only the resources, but requiring results. And that's a good thing. But without it, uh, we don't get anywhere. There are still organizations we meet where the obligation to submit a PPAP is just that. It's make work to submit documents and, and generates no value for the organization, let alone for the customer. I still run into organizations where when I'm told, when I'm asked to come in and, and either teach or facilitate uh, an FMEA project or an FMEA related project, who shows up people from quality and the quality manager because there's not a comprehension of the, the cross-functional multidisciplinary uh, nature of this process. Now, even the standards writers have, have made significant movement in requiring it and saying, if you look at the IATF 6949 standard, for instance, it reiterates over and over again that all these activities have to be conducted by a multidisciplinary team. Now, I'm going to talk about why, not just that it is a requirement. Um, the other thing that we see in advanced product quality planning and the use of FMEAs is a lack of understanding of the relationships and the linkages and the dependencies of these different activities. And where that lack of understanding exists, there are significant breakdowns in knowledge management, in risk management, and in communications. Uh, I still run into companies where, where the product engineering activity and the manufacturing world are separate worlds. In fact, in some cases, I think they're in, on separate planets. And this is a, a fundamental problem. Although again, organizations are evolving and learning and gradually coming to formally implement things like design for manufacturability and design for assembly and, in court and engaging manufacturing and process people in design reviews and development activities. So we're getting there, but without it, we are in serious trouble. Uh, I've mentioned already the, the sequencing and interfacing of these tools. You're gonna to find me emphasizing that a lot today because that's where it happens. And then the rationale or one, FMEAs are done and do not result in any improvement actions or FMEAs are done, but the outcome is if there are improvement actions, they're simply low hanging fruit. There are things that are obvious or easy to do or things the organization says, well, we should have been doing all along and they're not necessarily based on where's the risk? Where will we get most impact out of improvement actions. So I'm going to start off now with just going through some of the basics about FMEA, because again, I find they're, they're not fully understood. One, the first and, and arguably foremost is that conducting FMEA has to be an integral part of the development and launch process. It's not a separate activity. It's not a document to be filled out. It is part of the engineering, planning, and execution processes. It's not a quality function. It's an engineering function primarily. Doing it has to have a value proposition. There has to be a reason, and there has to be monitoring and measurement and assessment of impact. There has to be a payback. We need to see a reduction in design spins, a shortening uh, of the development, uh, a reduction in, in development and validation test failures. Every, every cycle of design, test, fail, redesign extends the amount of time required for product development, launch, delays launch, costs a lot of time and money, generates no value, and you don't get paid for it. You get paid for the finished design. You don't get paid for all the time that went into all the iterations that you went through to get to and all the test cycles you went through. Nobody's paying for that. Well, you're paying for that. The customer's not paying for it. They're paying for the finished design, which is what you quoted on. All of these things should lead to a reduction in, in the, well, they do, in fact, lead to a, a reduction in development cycle time. Quicker to market, Better first time results in, in, in uh, testing, verification, validation, but most importantly, shortening the time span between when we start to spend money on a project and when we get paid for it. The shorter the development launch cycle time is, 
the sooner it is that the investment in developing this product starts to generate a return. The longer it takes to get the part product to market, the longer the, the pay is delayed, if you will, the longer the return on investment is delayed. Overall cost of the project by the reduction in scrap, rework, uh, escapes, customer complaints, customer con concerns, all of which are waste, all of which are inefficient, all of which cost us a lot, and redoing everything isn't paid for. You get paid for one good part. You don't get paid for the one that you made and had to either destroy or rework and the one you had to make to the supply to them and the one you didn't get to make while you were making the replacement part for the one that we made defective. So we get paid for one part, regardless of how many iterations we go through to get it to be an acceptable part or subassembly or, or assembly. Roll those all together and you get significant reductions in cost and time. It doesn't happen, however, if we don't have disciplines like initiating the FMEAs early in the development process and developing the FMEA and the detailed design concurrently and developing the manufacturing process systems and tooling, it's gauging, it, et cetera, concurrently with PFMEA. Conjoining not only those things, but the actual manufacturing process development and the design, detailed design and development by multidisciplinary teams so that we get to an optimal, that is manufacturable product that meets all the requirements faster, with less waste and with lower costs. So we expect the effective use of FMEAs to achieve significant improvements in the design of the product, significant improvements in the engineering of the manufacturing process, significant improvements in our design controls and our manufacturing process controls, and as a result, significantly more value generated for the effort and the resources engaged. Ultimately, having an optimal product that is manufactured on an efficient and capable process. Those things don't happen without the effective use of FMEA. I can say that, you can put it on my gravestone. I have worked with probably 300 or more companies hands-on doing design, system design and process FMEAs. And I can tell you that the only way to reduce, prevent design failures that we know of, and the only way to reduce, prevent manufacturing process failures is through the systematic, methodical, and effective use of FMEAs. So we're going to focus today on 10 elements in this overall context that are keys to success. It, some of it is how to, some of it is when to, some of it is why to, starting with the necessity for not just a multidisciplinary cross-functional team, but several. Requirements management, you, I could spend the whole hour talking just about that because I can tell you from personal experience, I could spend the hour relating to you war stories of the hugely unsuccessful, costly, and in a couple of cases, disastrous product launches, entire train systems, entire jet engine systems, entire automotive systems, where there were critical failures at launch, post-launch, uh, that occurred because of inadequate requirements management. Employment of a, 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 a robust enabling software solution. I said in the introduction, I don't think you can do this process without an effective, robust software solution. I know that you from, again, from personal experience that you cannot create, manage, keep updated, keep aligned, keep linked, your design FMEAs, design verification test plans, your process flows, process FMEAs, control plans, operator instructions, inspection check sheets, and cyclical data coming from the process. You cannot do that in spreadsheet software and keep those documents living, current, aligned, valuable. You just can't. It's not feasible particularly organizations with, with large product families and, and uh, multiple ma manufacturing facilities 
and what have you. It just can't happen. And the industry, auto, starting with automotive, but it, the others are going to fall in line like dominoes. Aerospace, high-tech electronics, semiconductor, medical device industries are going to fall in line right behind automotive, as they historically have. OEMs are now requiring that you use relational database software to develop and manage these documents. And in at least two instances, not only is that required, but the solution has to be approved and reviewed by the customer. So the time has come. We are going to have to employ effective solutions. And those solutions have to have some very significant capabilities. They have to be able to create and manage part family or foundation FMEAs. They have to be able to create and employ product and process segments, that is, uh, foundation documents that can be strung together as part of a design FMEA or part of a process FMEA. And there have to be hardwired document linkages between the DFMEA and uh, failure modes and effects in a PFMEA between a process flow, a PFMEA and a control plan. Any change to any one of those documents has to be reflected in the other documents and it has to happen automatically through the software. Fortunately for us, the software we started to develop in the 80s and which has evolved into a very significant solution had those capabilities from the beginning. And it had those capabilities because that's why we developed the software. We said we have to have the ability to do these three things. And our clients have to have that ability to create and manage, the, to do this process and manage these documents. Co-development and engaging in product and process engineering, requirements and characteristics, focused failure and rational risk analysis. That will require a little explanation, but we continually run into organizations that are using FMEAs. DFMEAs are focused on functions without defined requirements. PFMEAs are focused on process failures without product characteristic criteria both of which doom the process to be ineffective. So we're going to talk about characteristics and requirements focused uh, use of these analytical tools and risk analysis. Buckled to that, you have to have an effective approach to root cause analysis. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Your focus when doing DFMEAs, PFMEAs, and Discipline problem solving, root cause analysis, RCCA, whatever you call it, has to focus on prevention. And what is identified as prevention needs to be cycled back into our process knowledge in our design and process FMEAs. Otherwise, it will be a one-time event and will we'll be lost to, to posterity. Too many organizations, when we look at their FMEAs and their control plans, rely on detection controls. It's an industry-wide issue in high-risk industries like aerospace, rail, automotive, transportation systems that are hazardous in their very nature tend to place a lot of reliance on detection controls. The automotive industry learned 30 years ago that that doesn't work well enough and so the, the evolution of a focus on prevention and the tools to achieve prevention is a huge part of this. Uh, and then management of the controls. Teams are charged to do FMEAs, to create control plans, et cetera, but what it, the output of those are not managed. There is a point at which they have to be taken, management has to take ownership of these decisions and these improvement actions and these controls, and we'll focus some attention on that. And then beyond controls, we'll be looking at management responsibility for management of and verification of improvement actions that come out of doing process FMEAs, design FMEAs, discipline problem solving. So we're going to start with the idea of a multi of multidisciplinary FMEA teams. My point in even including this is that we see organizations that are not willing to commit the resources to do this. 
So I will go into an organization and be shown an FMEA that we're going to work on or whatever. And I'll say, who did this? And they'll point to a junior design engineer who got stuck with the DFMEA because he was available. He was a junior and didn't have the workload. Or I'll, I'll be in, in the plant and they'll show me a PFMEA and I'll ask who did it and they'll point to the quality department or a single manufacturing or process engineer. It's not enough subject matter expertise to get it done. The point of the multidisciplinary team, and the cross-functional team, is not just that those functions or disciplines are represented, but that their subject matter expertise is brought to bear on the process or the design or both. There's literally no one, even I've worked with a manufacturing engineer who designed and built plant. And he could not do an effective PFMEA without the help of operators, setup people, maintenance people, process, other process engineers, because nobody knows everything except me. Nobody knows everything. You need, one, the contribution of these subject matter experts. And secondly, they need to carry away the knowledge that's gained by being part of this process. Because developing FMEAs is in large part a knowledge management process. Look at it. It's a failure mode and a facts analysis. The results of the analysis are knowledge gain. The point is, once that knowledge is gained, it has to be used. And that's where we see either an effective use of FMEAs or not. Getting the knowledge assembled from subject matter experts and then getting it de deployed through the FMEAs, the control plans, the operator and process instructions, the design guidelines, the lessons learned databases. You know, lessons are not learned until they're taught. So when I see that there is either in manufacturing or product engineering or both a lessons learned database, I say, how is, how is that taught? Because just having it reside somewhere is, if it was learned, it needs to be incorporated in the process. It needs to be incorporated in the design guidelines. It needs to be incorporated in the, in the process for work instructions and inspection instructions and maintenance instructions. So you need to think of this not only as a process for getting to a launch, it is a process for developing and managing knowledge beginning with understanding the requirements. That means having in place a cross-functional multidisciplinary approach to capturing, analyzing, and understanding the requirements coming from customers, coming from the legal and regulatory environment, and coming from our own internal knowledge. We need that it, to enable adequate technical and program risk and feasibility assessment a glaring weakness in many companies that I've dealt with. I even dealt with one company that quotes on billion dollar projects in rail systems and their entire bid process through to award of business was handled by a separate entity. And only once the business had been awarded was the, the program requirements handed off to a project team. And that was the first time they were seeing it. They had no contribution to assessing program feasibility, technical feasibility, program risk, technical risk. That's the primrose path to disaster. And that's exactly, by the way, what occurred in that context. Requirements are the, the meat of detailed design and development and manufacturing process design and development. And if they're not comprehensive, if they're not understood, if they're not traceable all the way through the process, it will lead to failure. The manufacturing process design will be inadequate. I went through an instance where a, a product and a process had to be redesigned very shortly before launch, because a couple of fundamental requirements either had not been communicated by the customer or were missed. Nonetheless, it meant reconfiguring the part that it was a, a small assembly 
and re reconfiguring the production line on which it was made, and a team of engineers going from the US and spending three months in uh, the Far East to get it done. Traceable back to requirements management. Change in configuration management. We have to have all the requirements defined and understood to start with in order to manage changing them or manage when they change, what happens. It's as in the instance I just described. Through detailed design and development, the functional requirements that are, are present from the customer, from the legal and regulatory environment, and from our own needs and expectations become characteristics in the design. They become features, characteristics, and attributes, and have to be understood in terms of their relationship to function, have to be understood by the production processes, the people working in the value stream. That's a clear linkage between the system or design FMEA and the manufacturing process flows and process FMEAs because failure modes in the process need to be understood in the context of how they will affect function, how they will affect the customer's manufacturing systems, how they will affect our own. So this relationship between function and characteristics we're gonna see is, is critical and the, the box at the bottom, when you get the PDF of this, when you download a recording of it or a PDF after, after we're done, highlight that box. Weaknesses or gaps at this stage in the process, it says may result, my personal experience changed that to a will result in failures arising in every phase all the way through to launch and beyond. It's practically guaranteed. And this relationship between functions and requirements, functions being what is supposed, you know, form fit function, what it's supposed to be and do are translated into or achieved by creating characteristics and features in the design and the manufacturing fabrication assembly processes need to clearly understand how characteristics affect function and where they need to be robust in terms of their process controls in order to ensure that they prevent critical failure modes, that they control less critical failure modes and essentially do everything possible to eliminate failure modes at all. So this idea of understanding the design, look, I came through so many factories where literally the people making a part or a product didn't know what it went into didn't know what it, I've been in jet engine component manufacturing plants where people running critical machining operations on critical components did not know what the function of a component was. I was with a guy in a machining operation doing an FMEA on, on, on machining a, a bearing race and only in that FMEA process with a design engineer present did the people in that plant and that operator in particular come to understand that a particular failure mode on a dimension on the print could result in a sudden catastrophic failure of a jet engine in a single engine aircraft. And he was not just a little bit stunned to find that out. And you look at leadership and say, hey, what do you think your job is? It's to enable this guy to be successful. And part of his Enabling him to be successful is giving him adequate knowledge to understand his process, the implications of the process, and the potential effects of something in his process being wrong. You can read Chuck Yeager's autobiography, and in it, there's a story of a guy in a plant who decided that he was being told to put a bolt in wrong, and he did it his own way, killed 17 pilots because putting that bolt in the wrong way caused a flap to jam on approach to landing and the pilots didn't have time to bail out. Or if they did, the plane was lost. But according to Jaeger, 17 pilots died because that operator didn't understand how what he was doing would affect the function of that control surface in an interceptor fighter. So this is not a small thing that I'm talking about in terms of requirements management. And I will tell you that in the world of functional safety, uh, safety of the intended function, automotive spice cybersecurity standards, and 
evolving into the, the aerospace standards like AS 9145 and the new standard AS 13100, which combines AS 9100 and AS 9145 and then adds some filigree to it, are all evolving towards this thing called a V model because it manages requirements and it does it in a dynamic way from the highest level, the highest, the highest system level, the, the train, the plane, the car, the truck, down through the systems, the subsystems to the components and aligning requirements, management, coming down the, the left-hand side of the V with verification and validation aligned going across the V. This is particularly critical in, in uh, mechatronic systems that have mechanical and software conjoined in, in embedded software uh, and, and affecting not only function, but functional safety and becoming more and more critical as the industry evolves towards semi-autonomous and ultimately autonomous vehicles. The same thing is happening in aerospace where control systems are becoming autonomous. They're becoming individual control surfaces are controlled by individual fly-by-wire systems rather than hydraulic systems. So that the functionality of these systems and their design development down the requirements chain and verification up the, the right-hand side of the V is essential and these things need to be integrated. They can't be done independently of each other. So software is, is a necessary tool to link requirements management into what you're seeing on the screen is the boundary or block diagram, traceable then to an interface matrix and a P diagram, all of which become food for the, DF, the DFMEA. And the DFMEA is initiated because of these three with a much better understanding of functions and requirements. So that the, the team doing the DFMEA, having gone through these other elements of the process, have much more robust information about functions and requirements when they get into the DFMEA and the detailed design and verification and validation testing both in the design and development process and then in the verification and validation of production product. We get to PPAP. So that's a teaser for the, that's part of what's needed in a robust software solution. And I'm going to talk about some others, which are that hardwired linkage uh, of information, starting with the requirements input into the design FMEA or system FMEA, subsystem design FMEA, the requirements feeding in, not, notice it's not just functions. Requirements are acceptance criteria. You have to have acceptance criteria to define failure. So when you're doing an FME, DFMEA on a particular function, you need requirements for that function in order to identify failure modes and to characterize them in terms of effect and to determine design causes. That leads us then to understand the risks in the process and gives us a robust design verification uh, uh, test plan and report because it's generated by the DFMEA in the software. The current design controls listed in the software are automatically incorporated into the design verification test plan. And that's aligned with the report of the test planning. Then the detailed design feeds into by listing, by identifying all the characteristics and features and attributes in the detailed design get incorporated into the process flow diagram, aligning the characteristics with the operations and using the correct kind of software. When you then open up a PFMEA, it will already have the operations and the product and process characteristics in it sort of forcing the discipline of looking at all of those requirements, characteristics are requirements in terms of potential failure modes, causes, effects, controls. And when that is done, when you open up the control plan, all of the current controls listed in the PFMEA are 
auto populated into the control plan. So the control plan is perfectly aligned with the process flow and the characteristics. And then the current controls in the PFMEA all show up automatically in the control plan and you can flush them out with details like what gauge is used, you know, with what frequency, what sample size, what reaction plants are involved. But the core data in all three of these documents are locked and aligned and you can't change one without changing the others. And when you change one, it automatically changes the others. So you are always you have an automated process for ensuring that these documents are aligned, which is a requirement of the standards. Uh, it is now also a requirement related to the software in, in a couple of the OEMs, and it's, it's going to be a real thing. Not only that, but then the controls that involve inspection and test flow down to the operator and process instructions, and the, and the inspection and test results can be linked back to the requirements in the, in the design. So you've got this closed loop between the functions and requirements in the DFMEA down to the inspection and test results on the shop floor. Now those are becoming, have become in some instances, a requirement uh, under customer specific requirements for Ford and BMW and a couple of other organizations who haven't officially published their requirements yet, but they're coming. But more importantly, it's our way of ensuring that we get our knowledge that came from the voice of the customer and the legal and regulatory environment and our own needs and expectations, make it all the way to the shop floor and get controlled and get verified on the shop floor. Now, that's a lot of work. So this issue of how do we do this efficiently in software, the solution came to the people at Omnex working on this literally back in the 80s. It has finally percolated into customer specific requirements that we be able to create and manage what we have called for decades part family FMEAs. They're being called by a couple of the OEMs foundation FMEAs. In other words, they're master FMEAs that you can then inherit the information from for subfamilies of parts down even to, to individual parts. So the software has built into it this capacity called inheritance, where the, the, uh, the requirements for and characteristics in, in DFMEA families, it'll be product requirements functions and requirements and in PFMEAs will be product characteristics and the operations, et cetera, for producing them can be captured in a parent or foundation uh, FMEA. And then when you have a child that is a variation on that parent, the software automatically inherits all the information from the parent and then you can add to or modify what is specific to the child, to the subfamily or, or sub uh, subfamily typically, and even from a subfamily, you can have an individual part which may have some unique feature, characteristic, or operation that's required, or inspection or test that's required. It inherits everything from the parents, and then you can modify it at the at this sub level, child, grandchild, whatever you want. The thing is that the cascading downward, the inheritance is automatic. If you make a change at a child level, one of the things the, the OEMs involved are requiring is if it's relevant, you need to be able to push it back up to the parent because it's a change that should occur in the parent. This is, this is a capability which is in the software. It's not recommended that we use it very often. We want it to flow the other way because of the implications of if you change something here and promote it up to here, it's going to change all the other children under that parent. So it is a carefully controlled change management issue. Primarily, the capability and the functionality is you don't have to redo everything every time there's a new part or a variation on a part. You can inherit it and then... <coughs> excuse me, build on it. So the way that this looks in software is to build a, a, a product structure, which is part families. Those part families can be grouped under an assembly or, or separately. 
And then from the global level, you're controlling all of your document templates and your risk tables and things like that. So they're forced into anybody doing a PFMEA has to use the temp the format or the template required and has to use the risk tables. But then as you cascade, in this case, from a battery module to a Y series under the battery module to a Y series 100, each one of those levels inherits from the parent and then you can add variations at the child level. So this is just illustrating what I, in a specific instance, what I was explaining at the, the prior slide. The power of this and how much labor saving it achieves is remarkable. It saves literally thousands of engineering hours creating, reauthoring uh, new documents when you shouldn't have to create a new document. That's part, it also ensures some disciplines, some consistency that what we have typically at the parent level is a best practice FMEA and control plan. And so when you inherit that, you're inheriting all those defined best practices and only adding or modifying what's needed at the child level. So this is just explaining in the case of Ford and BMW has published a very similar document, but Ford, Ford's requirements are very specific to this image. In fact, their requirements are based on this image. They're, they're, I'll just leave it at that. And then th they add the, the additional requirement, which I've mentioned already, which is that the, the process documents have to be locked together. They have to move in lockstep. Process flow, FMEA, control plan, operator and process instructions and inspection have to be locked together. So the changes to any one changes all of them. That's been a characteristic of, of the Aqua software since its invention in 1988. Uh, it's now a super characteristic and a whole suite of products. They're making a very specific point in the third bullet point here, though, which is that the foundation FMEA is not a replacement for part FMEA. The part FMEA needs to use a foundation FMEA to get to a specific FMEA for that part uh, so that it generates a control plan for that part. There is also a requirement. It's been present in the automotive industry for, for a long time. It's now articulated in some customer specific requirements called a reverse FMEA. We've done this for years. We simply called it process review. Process review takes an existing process and existing process documents, if they exist, process flow, FMEA and control, and attacks the process from the perspective of improving that process. And we use it particularly with poorly performing processes where we go out and we, we reconstruct the process flow because they're usually not, uh, if there is one, it's usually not robust enough to support this activity. Um, this is particularly true outside of the automotive industry. When, when I, I've worked a lot with aerospace uh, companies over the last 10 years, and this is a new thing. In, in most, or, or they have a drawing, but it's really a router. It's not a process flow. Using that, we then re-examine the process from a risk perspective. We rework the PFMEA based on data, based on inputs from the, the, by interrogating the process, if you will, that is talking to the operators, the setup people, the maintenance people, the manufacturing engineering people, the, the material handlers, uh, and reviewing internal data, talking to the quality people, the metrologists, ending up with an enhanced control plan and improvement actions to improve the process, which get implemented. But again, this is all hardwired and enabled by the, the linkages and alignments in the software. So the point that I'm making is it's not just during design and development that we use this, this, this discipline supported and enabled by the software is it's over the life of the product. And often we're starting from an existing process. I've been into aerospace suppliers where they've been making certain components for, for years, but they do not have a process flow FMEA or control plan. So we end up starting from scratch. 
and do this thing called process review. And it results in a, a generating an effective control plan and improvement actions for the process. So that's a very quick discussion of, of software in this context. And at this point, we're gonna take a quick poll. Should not take long. So just click on the appropriate answer. And when the uh, voting is, is complete, or if it's not complete, in about 30 seconds, we're gonna close the poll because it's a simple question. Hey, Miles, you want to close the poll? And let's see what kind of results we got. Oh, see what I said? <laughs> I said it's a problem. Only less than 20% of the companies represented in this poll are using a relational database type of software for this. I'm going to tell the other 80% that's got to change. It really does. This, this process simply cannot be done. And you certainly can't generate the kind of results that you want, the kind of impact. So have somebody call me or call somebody, but you need to leverage this, this necessity to get an adequate software solution. Certainly, if you're a supplier in the automotive industry, you're kind of doomed. You're going to have to, because I can tell you from 30 years of working with them, that Ford is like California, Ford and Toyota. Toyota is, is by California, I mean, they're the first to implement change. Toyota is the lead in implementing manufacturing process change. They're all lean, all that stuff is led by advances in the Toyota production system. But advances in quality management systems have always been led by Ford. And the rest of the industry has followed suit. So when I tell you that Ford's doing this and BMW is doing this, so BMW is doing it in the VDA environment and Ford is doing it in the North American automotive environment, it's going to evolve into all of the OEMs and all of the major first tiers you can absolutely count on. So get my screen to be alive again. Briefly, discussion of concurrent engineering. I'm finding this is a growing uh, practice, <clears throat> but I also find companies where the void or the abyss or the chasm between product engineering and manufacturing closely resembles the Grand Canyon, even when they're co-located. I was at a plant in the UK that was kind of, uh, uh, had one opening. It was, a, it had, a, had a, a, an inner quadrangle and it had a, a road that went between, and on the left-hand side was the engineering group, and on the right-hand side, and most of the right side was the manufacturing. I swear to God, there was a force field in the middle of that road so that people could not pass between engineering and manufacturing and manufacturing and engineering. It just uh, remarkable, but it doesn't work. And here's why it doesn't work. We need to look at the word technology, is it? Very quick lesson in ancient Greece, ancient Greek language, technology. The roots of the word technology are techni and ology. Ology, we all know, stands for knowledge of or study of, knowledge of. Techni is the key. Techni is craftsmanship. So the word technology literally means the knowledge of how to make something. And in the world of design responsible companies, that knowledge resides in two disciplines. One is the product engineering discipline. The other is the manufacturing process. But what you see is those two disciplines sit inside a circle. And the circle in this instance is the technology. It is our knowledge of how to make something. They are not separate from each other. They are part of the same thing. And if they do not work together, then that line down the middle in the yin yang symbol that I've co-opted for this idea has bumps and bruises and overlaps and malfunctions because the product design will violate the process parameters, the process parameters will constrain the product design 
and the technology is not successful as a result. When the two work together like this, then the circle gets bigger. That is our knowledge of how to make this product or these products expands. So the technology circle gets bigger and there is less risk of issues between the design and development of a manufacturing process or system and the design and development of products that are going to be made on that system. You get an interesting insight into this reality working in the semiconductor industry because it's, it's, it is different from most industries in that manufacturing process capability dictates design solutions, not the other way around. In traditional industries, we're kind of used to engineering comes up with a design and says, here, you figure out how to make it. I lived in that world for a long time. It's painful. In the semiconductor world, the process says, here's what you can make. So your design has to fit this. And that, that literally is Moore's law, the 50% the, the reduction year over year in size is a result of process engineering, not product engineering. The product engineering, how much stuff you can squeeze onto a chip is defined by the process. So it's, it's just a reversal of the traditional roles, but it illustrates the reality. You cannot design something that can't be made. You may have a lovely design, but it's useless if it cannot be made effectively and efficiently and competitively. And that's why this co-engineering issue, which is simply the putting back together again, the two knowledge sets, the two areas of subject matter expertise, the one that involves design and, uh, of the product and the other that involves the design of the process, just putting them back together because they have to work together. The reason that word technology grew out of ancient Greece was there was a time when the two activities were not separate from each other. Right? A, an artisan, a craftsman conceived of what they were going to make and made it all at the same time. Whether it was a pot on a wheel or it was da Vinci casting the largest singly, single cast piece of bronze in history, which was a horse done in a single investment casting. He designed the horse, the mold, and the process for making it all in one mind. That's, it has been recreated, by the way, in the Meyer Gardens uh, Sculpture Garden in, in uh, Michigan, uh, in Grand Rapids. If you ever get a chance to go there, it's incredible. But it's a single cast horse that when you're standing next to it, it's elevated, it's raised knee is at your head level. It's gigantic. But it perfectly illustrates this idea of the conjoined knowledge of process, product, materials, not just the tooling, not just, but the, the temperatures, the, the composition of the materials, all of that conceived and understood in one knowledge base. That's what we're building here. So I use the DNA molecule, molecule in this image to, to show the, the two working together and being codependent and needing to be developed concurrently. Now, when we get into the FMEAs and I talk about requirements-based analysis, this is all we're talking about, that you start in a DFMEA with a function expressed as a requirement, meaning with acceptance criteria, or in a process FMEA with a requirement defined as a characteristic with tolerances, dimensions, tolerances, attributes, like hardness or whatever, as the requirement. And then we go through the analytical process. But if we don't start with requirement, the rest of the analytical process is going to be flawed. It's going to be weak. It's going to result in, in, uh, in uh, column shift even. I've seen process FMEAs because the product requirement isn't defined. All the failure modes are listed are failures of the process. And the effect of that failure is defined as a defect in the product, which doesn't get us anywhere. We start from what does the product have to be, then in what way can it fail to be that, and what in the process, either design or manufacturing process, would cause that. 
And then we follow through the analytical logic illustrated in this slide to get to the which of these risks are intolerable and need to be addressed, either by changes to the design, changes to the design process, changes to the manufacturing process, improvements, changes to the control strategies in the manufacturing process. That's, that's the object. The, the analytical part ends when you get to the RPN or risk priority number or, or whichever methodology you're using. When you get to that point, you've done the analysis, you've gained the knowledge. It's the application of that knowledge in, in evaluation and decision-making, evaluation of risk and then decision-making about those risks that enables the FMEA to drive the process, to drive the management and reduction of risk. So this is illustrated briefly to say, look, this is not filling out a form. It's capturing an analytical thought process. It's going to branch and spread the way that this illustration shows it, because there will be, for each requirement, likely be more than one failure mode. For each failure mode, there will be likely more than one cause. For each cause and failure mode, there will be likely more than one control. And so the, the, the document has to expand, and this is hard to do in Excel or some spreadsheet. It's automatic in a relational, relational database-driven uh, software solution. The, the software just continually formats, and as it's formatting the, the process flow or the FME or the control plan, it's reformatting the other documents. So they're always aligned and consistent. And so you capture this link between the DFMEA that identifies what a failure to achieve a required function is and its effect, and the PFMEA identifying how the process can create that failure mode in the, in the product, both of which then have the same effect. So this linkage here is not just failure information, it's functional information. It's, it's communicating the function to the failure mode in the process so that the process owners understand the effect of a failure mode on function. And that shows up here, and that's why the illustration shows it as the effect being the same, regardless of, of whether it's a design or a process failure. Because we are trying to understand how to present, prevent something, we have to understand its cause. And that's not always evident when we do a FMEA. Sometimes we need to drill down and use root cause analysis Illustrated here, one method of root cause analysis, <coughs> excuse me, and a very common one is the use of the 5Y methodology. I put the graphic in here for two reasons. One is to illustrate that you have to be sure it's a causal chain, and you do that by answering the therefore. Got this? Why? Because of this. Because of this, therefore, we got the, the failure. You follow that chain going down. Every time you say the answer to the why for this is verifiable as if you have this, you'll get this. And that leads us to getting to the why where we don't have that. When we don't have the therefore, then we don't have a why. And that gets us very close to the root cause. What we're doing, by the way, when we go down the 5Y chain is going up the legs of a cause and effect diagram. So one of the things that I teach and encourage is that you use the 5Y to work your way up the various legs of the cause and effect diagram rather than simply brainstorming potential causes and then trying to validate them. It works a lot better if you go from I've got the failure, why? Because of this, why? Because of this, why? Because of this. Each time you ask a why, it's going to take you further into the fishbone or, or uh, Ishikawa diagram or cause and effect diagram, whichever term you prefer. <clears throat> now, the problem is linking this to the FMEA, which doesn't happen in the real world when we're using spreadsheets. When we're using software, it does happen. The, the problem to be investigated for root cause can be generated from the FMEA. 
and pursued through the discipline problem solving, the improvement, the, the causal analysis and the preventive and corrective actions to come out of it can then be, are <laughs> incorporated back into the FMEA. So we get a closed loop between what the failure was, what caused it, and what we did to prevent a reoccurrence. And that makes the, the problem solving integral to the FMEA and vice versa. The problem solving can generate the need to go update the FMEA. Both of which involve a focus on prevention. So when we talk about it in the design stage, here's what we're preventing. All right, this, this is legitimate. I didn't make up the, the number, 18,000 varies from industry to industry, but what it's saying is pay me now or pay me later. If I can identify a potential design failure mode in the virtual world, in, in computer-aided engineering and computer-aided design, if I can identify it then, the cost is small, 1x. If I don't identify it until I'm into hardware and, and, and verification or validated testing, it gets a lot more expensive. In fact, in the aerospace world, I've been told that that should be 100x, not 10x. Depends on the context, what industry you're in, but it's a lot more than this. And if we don't find it until we're in manufacturing production, serial production, and then we find it, now the cost gets another at least one more zero added to it to make the engineering changes and it pushes time. You know the scenario, you've lived in it. Ah, but if we don't catch it in manufacturing, and here's the rub, if it is occurring in manufacturing, it's going to get out into the world. When it gets out into the world, because often that's the only way we find out it's happening, is we get warranty claims or we get field failures or we get customer complaints, those come with a very large price tag. And the burning money is simply there to represent undefinable or unlimited liability. If you're Takata and you chose to use unstable material in your airbag impellers, you're out of business. Multi-billion dollar company down the drain. Sold off in pieces, and the only remaining part of it is the plants that are making all the replacement parts for the recalled vehicles, of which there are millions, because of an engineering decision to go with an unstable material. An ignition switch can work this way. It can cost the OEM three, four, five billion dollars. Oh, not to mention the lives lost because of it. So that the, the judgment against uh, GM, this is years ago and was public knowledge, so I'm not, the judgment levied against them by a jury for the side saddle uh, fuel tanks on pickup trucks, uh, liability claim, the, the initial jury award, believe it or not, was somewhere in the neighborhood of $350 billion. Now that was reduced by the courts and judges and everything, but that's, that burning money is huge if we don't prevent it. So we engineer into the development process, not just the DFMEA, but the DFMEA depends on well-defined functions and requirements. And we get that from this discipline of, of oops, sorry, of incorporate, of doing a boundary diagram, doing the P diagram. And I showed you the, the, the system-based solution to this to feed robust functions and requirements into the DFMEA so that the test plan is robust and the design is robust and the risk of failure is significantly reduced. In a process FMEA, we do it first by ensuring that the product characteristics are incorporated in the FMEA, but then we significantly focus on prevention controls and actions to reduce the risk of failing to achieve those requirements. So the whole point of doing a PFMEA, frankly, is to understand causation because only by understanding what causes something can we prevent it from happening. So then when we look at the types of controls in a PFMEA, obviously the preferable one is the level one control, which eliminates the error state. The failure mode cannot occur. 
the level two control detects the presence of the error state, stops the process before it can make the defect. So level one and level two are preventive. Level three, which is the one that so many control plans we see rely on, only detects the failure after it has occurred. And that's bad enough, but what's worse is all detection controls fail, which means that some of the defects are going to escape. That's kind of Watkins' law. <laughs> Every, and it's based on personal experience that no matter how robust we think a detection control is, it can and will be defeated one way or another. So when we rely on detection controls, they have to be robust. They have to be, to be of value. They need to be in station. They need to be automated if at all possible. They must stop the process when they detect the defect and not permit the defective product to progress. I, I've actually seen detection controls that destroy the product. As soon as the test mechanism detects that the product is defective, it can't be reworked. So the machine literally destroys the product. It can't get out of the test station in one piece. So it, it may either lock the defective product in place or in, in extreme examples like the one I just described, may destroy the product, render it. That, by the way, is now a requirement of the IATF standard that, that there be a methodology for rendering a product unusable at the time that it's made defective, if it can't be reworked. So it needs to be destroyed in some way so that it cannot continue. And mistake proofing is a detection control that enables correction meaning that it's an assembly operation or something. And when the error, the mistake, the defect is detected, there's an opportunity to fix it in station before it proceeds. All of those are robust, but only when we don't have a choice, when we can't prevent it. Uh, and that's a lot. There's no question that we have to have effective detection controls. But they will. we'd like them to be the Maytag repairman and have nothing to do because our prevention controls are so effective. Managing the controls is a major key to this whole process. So we put up some strategies for this, which include one, making sure you're controlling all of the requirements and to at the extent possible, you're controlling the process rather than just relying on controlling the product. That means that the controls are preventive rather than relying on detecting a defect. As much as possible, we need to employ variable controls because that enables us to see variation in the process and try to control it before it produces defects uh, and waste. Um, optimally, that means error proofing so that the cause of failure can't occur. If we are relying on, on a detection control, then it's at the process step rather than at the end of the end of the process when you get maximum waste, when you find out after all the value added steps that a product has to be has to be reworked or, or destroyed. That's the highest cost, worst case version. And also it suggests that there may be other defects coming because we didn't figure out that the process was making defects until they got to the end of the line. That may be a whole string. We get it at the process step. If you're going to prevent it, that's the only place you can prevent it is at the process step. All of this, though, is dependent on this last bullet, which is managing the control method. What do we mean by that? We mean management responsibility for ensuring we select the optimal method, that we ensure that it is implemented, that we verify that it is effective, that we verify the competency of the people using it, and that we verify that it is sustained. Those are management responsibility. It's not the FMEA team. It's not the control plan developers. It's not even just the local uh, supervision or leadership. It is an overall management responsibility to ensure. This is why the automotive industry evolved something called layered process audits. Layered process audits evolved in automotive to fundamentally require site leadership to go out and verify that the control plans were effectively implemented, effective in practice, and when improvements were implemented, those improvements were verified and were 
effectively in practice, all of which relies on selecting the right type of control for the risk that we're addressing. Fundamentally, the message about improvement actions is the same. It is that, that when the team has gotten to the point of making recommendations for improvements to the design, improvements to the design process, improvements to the production process, improvements to the controls in the production process, it becomes a management issue to approve and get those changes implemented. Often the team's not in a position to implement the improvements. They're the responsibility of process owners or area managers, or if they're significant enough, could even be site managers that are responsible. But there are things to make sure it happen. <clears throat> and among them is that the paperwork is brought up to date, that the FMEAs are current, the control plans are current, and that if there are related uh, uh, work instruction standards, other documentation, uh, that if there's an effect on, on key or special characteristics, um, and that we understand what we're left with, that after we've taken these actions, what is the residual risk involved? And is it acceptable or do we need to do something further? Or where the team has said the risk is acceptable, we don't need an improvement action, ultimately management signs off on that and says, yeah, we agree, or management says, no, we don't agree. That's an unacceptable level of risk. Go back and come up with a solution. We need an improvement action to reduce that risk. And if there's a safety implication, then if you're in the automotive or the aerospace world, you know that your operational risk uh, management requires that uh, products or, or processes that relate to, to safety, not just functional safety as is design, defined in, in ISO 26262, but functional safety period. You've been making a mechanical part, no electronics, no ISO 26262, but a significant uh, safety risk is involved. Then you kick in these additional rigors to, to manage it. Ultimately, the output, the, the risk that remains after we've done the analysis, after we've implemented improvement actions, or while we're in the process of implementing improvement actions, the risks, the process are owned by management. I've been in too many organizations where, you know, the, the FMEA is signed off on by some, some engineering manager or whatever, and nobody else. And I look at the plant, the site leadership team, and I say, no, you own this because you got people involved, you got technology, you got facilities, equipment, tooling, you have all these things, you have suppliers involved, you have logistics involved, all these things. It's not simply a quality or a manufacturing engineering responsibility. So actually we'll see that in both the SAE J1739 and in the AIA GVDA, uh, approach to FMEA, the final step is, is uh, report to and uh, management and approval of and acceptance of the results. So these processes have added some, I find that record keeping is inadequate. We don't know why we did something or what we did. So it's valuable each cycle through this process that we have a record of what came out of it, what, a summary of the key findings, the highlights, the, the most significant risks addressed and how were they addressed? And was the FMEA process effective? Did it achieve? We do this with metrics. How much did it redu reduce internal defects, scrap, rework? The same thing with DFMEA. How much did it reduce design spends, test failures, how much did it remember the met metrics at the beginning? How much did it reduce uh, uh, successful launch? How, how, design development cycle time, time to launch, how were those affected measurably by this process? So I've got a last polling question for you. Can we, can we put up the poll? Because it's getting late. I've run a little bit over here. Hopefully some of you have stayed with me. 
So the question is, does your system or approach currently enable management and traceability of requirements from, we'll say from the bidding phase or the planning phase, voice of the customer, legal and regulatory requirements and internal requirements, all the way to shop floor inspection and test and back. Do you have you know, two-way traceability of uh, functions and requirements? Pretty quick question. So if you're done, ah, it's a little bit better response. We've got a, a little over 40% who said yes and a little less than 60% who said no. Um, that's good. I, I, I like that. <laughs> it's at least close to 50% uh, say yes. This, this is not only a business necessity, but it is also becoming a regulatory requirement. That is the government's involved. Department of Defense is involved. If you're in aerospace and defense in any way, OEMs are becoming involved in writing standards that require this uh, traceability uh, up and down that V model that we talked about. So, okay, that's interesting, interesting response. There are a couple of alternative methodologies to all of this out there. Uh, and just as a point of reference, this, our software is enabled, but there is something called a multi-point FMEA for doing uh, DFMEAs of, uh, of, of uh, uh, mechatronic devices, which often have multi-point failures or causes of failure. There is, outside of the automotive industry, a standard that most industries follow called SAE J1739. They have issued a revision to it. It is pretty consistent with the traditional model because SAE and, and the automotive North American automotive industry have stayed aligned on this. So it's not so much the format as the risk assessment at the end and the fact that the SAE has adopted a strategy adopted by the AIAG VDA handbook, which is to describe a seven step or eight step process, depending on which one that you're looking at. So the AIAG VDA handbook, that is a customer specific requirement for some uh, uh, OEMs, mostly the European ones, the North American ones, and Japanese companies and Korean companies seem to be taking the position that they will accept it but not require it, whereas you have European and particularly the German companies which are requiring it. So uh, if you have to do it for, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, I'm saying that if you're required to do it uh, for a, a customer, your other customers will accept it. Um, the point I wanted to make here is that all of them are supported from a, the same data entry. In other words, you put the same information into the system and then you generate the, the analysis, excuse me, in any one of these or the standard fourth edition approach. So just a reminder that this software solution issue is now becoming a mandatory one rather than a recommended one. And I, I think, and this is an opinion, but it's a widely held opinion, that Ford and BMW are just the first to codify this in their published customer-specific requirements. Others will follow. And the software will need to be able to do these things, have foundation or family FMEA structures, have hard alignment and linkages between and within and between the documents, and live maintenance and change management, meaning that because it's digital, because you can, you can edit it daily or weekly, very quickly, uh, it's dynamic and all the documents will change when you make minor edits to it. That will be a requirement and a, a, a connection to problem solving ADRCCA will be required. It will not necessarily be a hard connection like it is in, in Aquapro, but it, it will be a requirement. So there's an there's a image here of saying you really need a, a enterprise-wide uh, integrated set of platforms, not just FMEA generating software. Oh, one last bullet point reports to customers. That is a requirement in both the Ford and BMW. Not only 
<coughs> not only report to, but the solution needs to be approved, which type of software and what the documents look like and that sort of thing need to be accepted. Approved is not the right word. The word they use is accepted based on a review. So approval is not the right word there. When you get a PDF of this, you should change the word approval to acceptance. They have decided to get out of the business of approving your work and to accept it or not accept it. Uh, that leaves the responsibility or accountability with the generator rather than the entity that accepted it. So some last points. These are keys, not only to the success of the FMEA team, but basically to the whole process. Our people need to be adequately trained and competent to do this work. The scope needs to be constrained to what is reasonable for the team to work. There needs to be well-defined reasons, that is objectives and, and uh, 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 measures. Uh, appropriate amount of resource, that is back to this idea that you need the requisite subject matter experts. They need a process to follow. That's one of the solutions that both AI, GVDA and SAE incorporated into their latest revisions is a well-defined process to follow, to do this work, which is an enhancement and I recommend it. If you're using the, the uh, automotive fourth edition approach, then have your own process built around it. Um, the, the time is allotted for analysis and improvement is a big one. When you get a hard copy of this, highlight that, draw a red circle around it, whatever. That's the most significant issue we run into is either people saying we don't have time to do it or we're not allowed the time to do it or I can't afford to have my people spend their time doing it, all of which reasons lead to the resources don't get allocated, the time isn't allotted, the work, value added work doesn't get produced, and all of this goes up the pipe. Okay. So we do a lot of work in this area. As I said, we've been doing it since, since the 80s. So a lot, of, there is much on our website. There is much more in the hard copy of this that you'll be able to download from from uh, uh, from the uh, from our website recording. I'm not going to read through to you all the different training offerings we have, but this is some indication of how much work we do in this area in all types of FMEAs to all standards written for FMEAs, but most importantly to customers' needs to have a successful. Uh, new product development launch process and ability to manage continual improvement. And then finally, there is a comprehensive software solution available. And uh, you can either request uh, more information on it. You can go to the Omnex Systems, one word, omnexsystems.com to see more about it, or you can contact and somebody will arrange something for you. Quick check for questions. Ah, it's a good one. What, who are the key figures that should be part of developing an FMEA? Mainly DFMEA. Um, you need, <laughs> just to tick off the boxes, most organizations I deal with, and that's a lot in terms of design FMEAs, I've even spent a couple months recently doing system FMEAs for a jet engine. Uh, you need a, a facilitator. That is someone who isn't necessarily an engineer like me, but who can facilitate the process with a collection of subject matter experts. And then what subject matter experts you need are sort of defined by the context. You, 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 you need design engineers. You may need metallurgists. You may need electrical engineers. The, the different engineering disciplines needed for a, a system or design FMEA depend on the technology. But you, you do need a team. When we did, uh, when we were working on a system FMEA for this particular aspect of a system in a jet engine, we had a team of about 11 different engineering disciplines involved. That included testing people, test engineering, test planning people, uh, 
as well as design and development people and things like metallurgists uh, and uh, uh, in, in a couple of instances, we engaged someone from a supplier who had some insight into a components that were going into the system that we were working on. So you reach out to uh, the supplier. I actually participated in one uh, design FMEA where it was a component going into a jet engine, going onto an aircraft, and the aircraft manufacturer had insisted on having its people involved in the DFMEA process. That was the result of their not being happy with the product. So as unusual as that was, it still can happen. You may choose to ask a customer representative uh, to make themselves available. And this is easier to do now with Zoom and remote meetings, teams and things like that to get insights. When, when we were doing the process FMEAs at various uh, vendor sites, uh, we had from the customer design engineering either physically present or participating virtually through through Zoom or Teams meetings. But it, for product engineering in particular, it's contextual. It depends on what technologies are involved. What you don't want is to just have one or two design engineers and figure you have it covered because you won't. We have run long. Uh, for those of you who are patient enough to stay with me, I appreciate it. I apologize for running long. I knew I was trying to cover too much. If there are any other questions, uh, now just key it into the, the question uh, Q&A tab, and I'll be happy to, to answer it. We still have quite a few people out there, which I sincerely appreciate since I'm eating. If you're in, in the same time zone as me, I'm eating into your lunch hour. I could be e eating into your sleep if you're in China or India or one of those places. So, well, then, if there are no further questions, I thank you very much for your attention. I thank you for staying with me for this long. I hope this was helpful. Uh, we do run webinars and trainings on the how-to aspects of these things and would be happy to, to provide those services to you. As I clearly indicated, I think we do a lot of on-site work facilitating this process. We even engage people as long-term project managers through our, our uh, 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 sister company, uh, Plantech, so we can support all of this and we're doing a lot of this training virtually now. I've conducted uh, FMEA training sessions. Well, the ones I just recently conducted with, with the, the jet engine company, all of that was done virtually. Uh, I've trained teams in Europe. Unfortunately, that means typically my getting up at two o'clock in the morning to do it, but our associates do it as well. So there's a lot of support available. Uh, and certainly, um, if you're not already looking, you need to be looking at software. I happen to, I have nothing to do with the, our software, by the way, except as a user. Uh, and sometimes I help as a subject matter expert in implementing the software, that is how to use it. Uh, uh, but it, I know that it's very good and I know you need a solution. So uh, I, I will tell all of you that the time has come you can tell your leadership or management if they're not present for this, that the time has come that your customers are going to mandate something we should have been doing all along. Because if we're doing APQP in any context, and we're doing FMEAs in any context, we need this kind of software solution. And whether it's Omnex's or somebody else's, you cannot, I'll say it one last time, you cannot do this process effectively without enabling software. Anyway, I didn't do this to sell software. I did it to convey some knowledge. I hope it's been helpful and time well spent for you. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention, for joining and for staying with it this long. And wish you all a, a great day, afternoon, evening, morning, whatever, wherever you are. Thanks very much and so on. Cheers.